Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Dad Howard and we're going to do a Bible study. This is the last lesson in the fall study book from Explore the Bible. We've covered in the last 13 weeks Philippians, Colossians, and today we have a lesson on Philemon, a very short letter that's a personal letter from the Apostle Paul to a man named Philemon in the church in Colossae. So let's review what we've learned so far in Philippians and Colossians. By the way, I've thoroughly enjoyed these, uh, these lessons. They've just been amazing to me. Okay, so Philippians is all about living with real joy. That means happiness. As Christians, God wants us to be happy because of all the things that he has given us in Christ Jesus. In spite of whatever's going on in the world around us or in our own personal circumstances, Paul says that we are to be happy because of Christ. Paul explains that we can be happy in Christ no matter what's happening. And Colossians then is all about being re-imaged, going from our old person to our new creation in Jesus. That whole uh, process that the Holy Spirit is doing in us. He explains that we're being changed, renewed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we start out as spiritual babies and we can then grow up spiritually into the image of Christ. And Paul then concludes by explaining that all of this will happen within our roles and responsibilities of our relationships. That's bad news for those of us who are engineers, but it's good news from a spiritual perspective because God created us in relationships. It needs to be that you're that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Finally, today's lesson, Paul gives us a living example in the letter of Philemon of how all of this works together. I don't know about you, but lessons are great. I thoroughly enjoy sermons, but there is nothing quite like a testimony because it's something that's happened in a person's life. And the letter to Philemon is just exactly that. It's a testimony of how the gospel gets applied in real life. So... Revel Restoration, that's the book of Philemon. It's a one chapter book, 25 verses, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about healing damaged relationships. Oh, that's good. Ta-da. All right. It fits just with last week. It, well, you know, it's a good follow on. I know. Whoever did this, but this were smart, smart people. people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Philemon, it's a high risk letter. And you'll understand what I mean when we get into it. There are three main characters involved in this letter. The writer of the letter, who is Paul the Apostle, he's writing it to a fellow named Philemon, and the subject of the letter is a returning the slave Onesimus to Philemon. Philemon has a slave named Onesimus who ran away, and Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon and with this letter, with a, just this one letter that he's got. And the purpose of Paul's letter is that he wants Philemon to restore Onesimus and forgive him for what he's done. We don't know all the things that he's done. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the book of Philemon. We don't know a lot of the details, but we can piece some of them together enough so that this really turns into a beautiful, beautiful letter. I want to spend just a minute talking about slavery in the Roman Empire. First of all, one out of three people in the wow. Roman Empire, 33%, between 30 and 40%, depends on who, whose statistics you use, but about a third of the people in the empire were slaves, 30 to 40%. That's a lot. That is a lot, okay? They range from illiterate laborers like uh, farmhands uh, to doctors and business managers. You remember Daniel was a slave in Babylon. Remember Joseph was a slave to Potiphar. Uh, and both of those people were really highly intelligent, highly educated people. So same way in the Roman Empire, slaves were all the way from itinerant, uh, uh, illiterate farm worker type uh, folks uh, they didn't have a lot of skills, all the way up to medical doctors, uh, business managers, and so we don't know where Onesimus falls in this range. Most slaves came from conquered lands. That's how the Roman Empire paid for all of their army. They would go into a new area, 
conquer it, they would take all of the possessions that they found, all of the, well, the valuables that they found that, that became their, their uh, loot, and then they would take the people and sell those people as slaves to other Roman citizens. And they took that revenue and they, they were able to pay for the army to go to the next country. When they ran out of places to conquer, they ran out of slaves and that began the downward spiral. It's just kind of like a pyramid scheme, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Slaves then were the property of uh, whoever owned them and they really had very few legal rights. As the empire matured over a 400 year period of time, more and more rights were given to slaves, but by and large, they were the property of their owners. And punishment for a slave that ran away would be either death or imprisonment. There was a bounty. If you returned somebody's slave, you would receive a bounty for that, that slave being returned. Now, so let's get the picture straight. Uh, Tychicus, who was the bearer of the letter to uh, the Colossian church and the Laodicean church, was also the bearer of the letter to Philemon. So at least those three letters were Tychicus was bringing those from Paul in Rome to uh, the church in Colossae. All right. And so he's with Onesimus, who is the slave that's being returned. So as Philemon, who, by the way, was probably the pastor because the church was meeting in his house, but he was probably at least a church leader. He, let's assume here for a second that Philemon is actually the one who is going to read the letter to the people in the church. So he's just getting through reading this letter, and the letter says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So Onesimus is kind of, let's assume he's sitting in the back room here and, and, and Philemon is reading this, this, these scriptures, uh, this letter. Whatever you do, he says, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And then he goes on to say, masters provide for your slaves what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So as he's reading this letter from Paul to his church in his house, Onesimus, who is a runaway, his runaway slave, is sitting there while he's doing this, okay? Now, when Tychicus and Onesimus arrived at Philemon's house, can you imagine the look on Philemon's face? He's seeing this slave that he hasn't seen in quite a while, and he is like, whoa, what are you doing back, okay? There's got to be this amazing thing. And the dictator just hands him this letter from Paul. It says, you need to read this. It'll explain everything. So let's keep going. Who was Philemon? Who was this guy? What do we know about it? We don't know a lot, but we know some things. First thing we know is that when you read through the letter, Paul calls him a Christian leader. He calls him his fellow worker. He, ref he says of, about uh, Philemon that you refresh the hearts of the people in the church there. He may have been the pastor after Epaphras. Epaphras was the pastor and he went to Rome to tell Paul that they needed some help. Okay, and he stayed there with Paul in Rome and left, basically left uh, Philemon in charge, it looks like. The reason we think that is because the early church history tells us that a man named Philemon became the bishop of the church in Ephesus. I don't know, it could have been a name like Tom or Bill or Bob, I don't know that. There could have been a lot of Philemons, but some of the early church people believe that this was the same Philemon. He also, we know from the letter, hosted the Colossian church in his home. He was a friend of Paul's. As a matter of fact, Paul won him to the Lord, probably while he was traveling on business in Ephesus. Paul knew Philemon's family. When he addresses this letter, he calls out Philemon's wife and his son by name. So Paul considers Philemon to be a partner in the work of the gospel. We also know that he was well-to-do. He had a house big enough for a church you know, some number of people to, to come to. Uh, we also know that he's got guest rooms because Paul asked him to prepare one for him. And he also we also know that he had at least one slave and maybe more. So he was a wealthy person. This is not uncommon in the church. Remember Lydia? Remember Priscilla and Aquila? Remember Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? Those were all fairly wealthy people uh, in, in the early church. 
So it's a personal letter from Paul to Philemon. And let's get started with it. I'm going to start in verse 1, even though the focus verses are 8, start in verse 8. But I think it's important for us to get the intro part. Paul, who he said, calls himself a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Paul is transitioning. He's old at this point. He's transitioning his ministry to Timothy to take that over. So in this letter, he's also saying that Timothy is part of the letter writing. He says, the letter is from me, but it's to Philemon, who is our dear friend and our fellow worker. And he says, also, I'm writing this letter to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, and that's probably his wife and his son, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, Philemon, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a fairly standard uh, approach. Uh, and then he has a gracious, what I would consider a gracious greeting to Philemon. He says, I always thank my God I as I remember you in my prayers. There's nothing like knowing if you're Philemon that the apostle Paul is praying mm -hmm. for you. I mean, that, that is amazing. I love knowing that people are praying for me mm -hmm. when I'm preparing my lessons. So it, it just really gives me a sense of confidence that, wow, somebody is actually lifting me up in prayer. Verse 5, because I hear about your love for all of his holy people. Remember, it's all about relationships and your faith in our Lord Jesus. I pray then that your partnership with us in the faith, Paul is about to start explaining the purpose of the letter. He's about to drop a shoe for Philemon. And the shoe that he's going to drop is, I'm going to ask you something in this letter. I'm going to make a plea to you. And that plea, I think, I believe, is going to deepen your understanding of every good thing that we share for the sake of Christ. In other words, I'm going to ask you to do something that's not going to be easy. And it's going to seem like it's something you don't want to do in the natural man. And because I'm asking you to do it, I believe with all my heart that it's going to deepen your understanding and your faith. Your love then has given me, well, I understand what you're doing, that you're doing a great service, Paul says. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Keep that phrase in mind because he's going to come back to it a little bit later. It's, so whatever Philemon has done, he at least has the gift of encouragement mm -hmm. because he refreshes the hearts of the Lord's people. He is a, a powerful influence in this little church, in this little town. Therefore, he says, now the reason for this letter, Paul finally gets around to the, the point of the letter, and he's, it's not going to be a small ask here. And of course, uh, Onesimus is standing there kind of, you know, wondering how this is going to turn out. Therefore, Paul says, although in Christ I could be bold and I could order you to do what you really should do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Let's dissect that verse. He's saying, one thing he's saying here is I could order you. Now, I'm not sure exactly what authority Paul has, but one of the things that makes it clear to me is that whatever job Philemon has in the church it must be an official job because Paul is in an official position of authority uh, over Philemon. So he says, in theory, I could order you to do this. Yet, I'm going to say, I'm going to step back from the, the, that position. I'm going to say, I prefer to appeal to you instead on the basis of love. He says, and he says, I'm not going to pull rank or authority in this case, I'm just going to logically walk you through this, Philemon. He says, I'm not going to come to you as Paul the Apostle. I, I'm going to come to you as an old man. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then I'm going to appeal to you for my sin. And all of a sudden, we're going to get introduced to not a runaway slave, but a new Christian. He says, I'm going to appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son, who became a Christian while I was in chains. So let's take a look at, at this. Let's break this apart. He says, Paul, and I'm now I'm an old man. That, that's why he's handing things over to Timothy. I'm an old man. I'm also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And then at the end, he says, I'm in chains. So he wants to paint the picture to Philemon that he really is in a fairly limited position. And he's in prison, 
probably going to lose his life, and he's old, okay? So that's kind of how he's, he's saying that, but I'm making this appeal to you. So let's look at the other part of it. He says, the appeal to you then is for this person who used to be a very uh, worthless, uh, disobedient, uh, miserable, uh, disappointing slave, okay? I'm going to appeal to you because now he is my son, Onesimus, because he became a believer. Formerly, Paul says, I understand this. Formerly, I mean, we've talked, Onesimus and I have talked a lot about it. I've talked about it with Epaphras. He says, we understand that when he was your slave, he was useless. There's no other way to describe it. He just was not a very good worker. I don't know what his job was, but apparently Paul says there's no disagreement here. He was useless. But I'm telling you, Philemon, the new Onesimus is useful, both to you and to me. I'm sending him back because even though he's my very heart, now that's a really powerful thing for Paul to say. Paul is saying that Onesimus has become such an integral part of his support team there in Rome that he really does not want to give him up to send him back. He wants to keep him. He says, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. My first choice, Paul says, was just to let you know that he's here and that I'm going to keep him. He says, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But when I thought about it, I did not want to do anything without your consent. After all, he is your slave. He's your property, not my property. He's, he's, not, he's not free to be my servant here without your permission. So that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. I want you to be the person to make this decision. So I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm just going to make the plea that you do it. Verse 15, perhaps the reason that Onesimus was separated from you for a little while, in other words, God is saying, or God is saying, Paul is saying, perhaps the fact that he ran away wound up being a good thing. Because after all, he did become a Christian and it did completely change his life. He says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, for eternity. Right. No longer just as a slave, but better than a slave as your dear brother in Christ. He is very dear to me, but now he is even more dear to you both as your fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. He apparently helped Paul so much, Paul believes with all his heart that he's going to be a big help in the church in Colossae. So, he says, Paul's beginning to conclude his request. It's a very short letter, but it's very powerful and very dangerous for Onesimus, who had no idea how Philemon, Philemon was going to take this. So he says, if you consider me to be your partner in the gospel... I want you to welcome Onesimus back as you would welcome me. When you look at him, you're looking at me, Paul says. If he's done you any wrong, of course he's done him wrong. He left him. He was useless and then he left, okay? Or he owes you anything, I want you to put it on my account. This is a pretty cool thing Paul's about to pull here, so watch carefully. I would not want to go to court against Paul. He's a shrewd guy. So he says... If he owes you anything, I just want you to charge it to me. So you think, okay, fine, there's a book here and it's got things that are charged to Paul and then that are things that are charged to Philemon. So let's keep going. Verse 19, I, Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. In other words, this is not only a letter just to you personally, it's a letter I wrote personally with my own hand. He says, I promise you I will pay it back. Whatever he owes you, whatever he's done, whatever debt there is, I, Paul, promise you I will pay it back. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, by the way, when you take a look at the bank statement here, not to mention you owe me your very self. And what we infer there is that Paul led Philemon 
to the Lord, probably because Paul didn't go to Colossae, probably when Philemon was visiting Ephesus with his family uh, on business, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing. Uh, he met Paul, heard the gospel, became a believer. And so, so, so Paul pulls this trump card and he says, hey, whatever Onesimus owes you, whatever debt there is, uh, just understand I'll pay for all of that. Oh, by the way, you do remember that your very eternal life you owe to me because I introduced you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, verse 20, I don't, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in this, in the Lord. Just the same way that Philemon was famous for refreshing the hearts of the church there in Colossae, he says, please refresh my heart in Christ the same way. What a beautiful way to finish it up. Concluding plea, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart. Mm -hmm. And he says, verse 7, remember this, you've refreshed the Lord's people. Yeah. Confident, verse 21, of your obedience, not to Paul. Paul's portraying himself as an old man in chains. He says, I'm confident of your obedience, not to me, but your obedience to the gospel, your obedience to the requirements of love that you're going to read in chapter three. We didn't have chapters, but in chapter three of Colossians, when you're reading it to the church, you're going to find out this. One thing more, I prepare a guest, prepare a guest room, he says, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. <laughs> So, so he says, I'm not sure how you're going to deal with Onesimus. I'm asking you to deal with him this way, but I want you to also understand that in a little while, as soon as I get out of prison, I'm going to come and I'm going to stay at your house. And then he tosses this in in verse 23. He says, just another little note here. Your former pastor Epaphras sends you greetings too. Hmm. A little pressure there for Philemon. Now we're not told how this worked out. We are not told how Philemon reacted to this letter. That's it. That's all we've got. But we have to believe that the reason that a personal letter is in the New Testament, there's no new theology here. There's nothing Paul's teaching us through this letter One except thing. that restoring broken relationships is amazingly good, okay? And, but we do know this, Philemon's got this letter and the church history says that Philemon becomes the bishop at the church in Ephesus. And we know that it was in Ephesus where they compiled a list of all the letters that Paul wrote. And Philemon put this letter. That's cool, that's got like it. In the Bible. Yeah. So let's summarize this. <clears throat> Onesimus, a disobedient slave, deserts his owner. Somehow, we don't know how, the slave finds the Apostle Paul. Maybe he ran into Epaphras, who he knew from Colossae. Don't know how this worked out. But somehow, he finds the Apostle Paul. Clearly, he hears the gospel. Clearly, he becomes a Christian. And then, he is a completely changed person. And now the new Onesimus is being sent back to his Christian owner. But you got to ask yourself this question. How do you think Onesimus feels? He burned a lot of bridges. He was very disobedient. He ran away. In terms of how you rank your slaves, he gets a failing grade. And now he's being sent back to face the owner. Mm -hmm. So how do you think he feels? I don't know how you think he feels. I would be scared to death be because the punishment was either death mm -hmm. or imprisonment unless he's forgiven. And now standing at the front door, Philemon opens the door and he finds Tychicus and his long lost, disobedient, useless slave Onesimus. How do you think Philemon feels? This is going to be a rough weekend at Philemon's house. 
As, as Philemon reads the letter Colossians to his home church, he speaks this verse. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. Uh, uh. If any of you has a grievance against somebody, uh, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Uh, why has it got to be so hard? So the conclusion. Paul says in Colossians, it's the relationships. That's where God's going to make us new. That's where the Holy Spirit is going to work on us. That's where he's going to drag us from being the old Mike to the new Mike, from being the old you to the new you. The gospel message is amazing. The gospel promises are spectacular. If you take a look back at the, the lessons that I've taught, the first couple of lessons in Colossians when Paul is talking about how amazing the gospel is and how awesome, spectacular the promises are, those are, those are lessons where you get all excited and, and you can take a look at the views. The views are like 1,200, 1,400. But then you get to the third chapter of Colossians and Paul says, because of these amazing and spectacular things, you can now apply this mm -hmm. to your life. It got hard. And now, mm -hmm. sometimes it's going to get hard. Just ask Philemon and Onesimus. Mm -hmm. Did it get hard? You better believe it got hard. And the only way the Holy Spirit says is to die to the old is to celebrate and embrace the new. Philemon and Onesimus are being given that chance. And we are too. When relationships get hard, when our hearts get broken, when our feelings get trampled upon, when things seem to be falling apart, that's when we get the chance to apply the amazing and spectacular power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, I've got a point to ponder. Almost 200 years ago, 170 years ago, back before uh, YouTube and before cell phones and before television, uh, At least they, had they had entertainment. Yeah, they did have cameras, okay? And part of the entertainment was this fellow named Charles Blondin, who crossed Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Not once, not twice, but a bunch of times. He crossed just walking blindfolded, just walking backwards. He crossed one time oh. walking on stilts. Oh. He crossed one time riding on a bicycle. And then finally, he actually crossed a bunch of times. He crossed with a stove. He made himself an omelet right in the middle. It's just the it's crazy stories, but there were huge crowds. But then the time that he crossed with a wheelbarrow, he got to the other side and there's this giant crowd screaming and yelling and celebrating. And he says to the crowd, he said, <clears throat> do you believe that I can walk across Niagara Falls on this tightrope with somebody sitting in this wheelbarrow? And they all shouted, yes, we believe that. And then he asked a second question. That was the easy question. The second question was, fine, which one of you would like to get in the wheelbarrow? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, nobody yeah. stepped forward. Yeah. Did they believe that he could do it? They've seen him do crazier stuff. Did they want to get in the wheelbarrow and be the person there? Absolutely not. That's hard. That required a lot of faith. But it turns out one year later, Harry Colcord, who, Colcord, who was his actually, <laughs> who was uh, Charles's manager, did ride across Niagara Falls strapped to Charles Blondin's back. Wow. Halfway across, Charles said to Harry, Harry, you are no longer you. You are me. And until I clear this place, these falls, I just want you to be a part.
part of me, your mind, your body, and your soul. If I sway, you sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. If you do, we shall both go down to our death. That's another message. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. We're not participating in this life by ourselves. The Lord is carrying us. He is our shepherd. The gospel of Jesus Christ changes everything in our lives. Do we trust him to bring us through when we're afraid? His promise to us is be strong, be courageous, because I'm never going to leave you. So the question then for us is Onesimus and Philemon, Mike and Beverly, are we ready to climb in the wheelbarrow and to put the gospel to practice in our lives? Pray with me. Father God, what a great way to end this wonderful fall quarter. Mm -hmm. Paul tells us about this wonderful gospel and all the things we have in Christ and the changes that the Holy Spirit is making in our lives. But then he says we need to start acting that way. We need to take off the old person and put on the new person. And we need to allow the Lord to work in our relationships because that's where the changes will be hammered out in the fire of our relationships. Father, thank you for this story about Onesimus and Philemon. We don't know a lot of details, but we do know that it must have been a wonderful, wonderful reunion. Father, we can thank you for all of these wonderful testimonies we read in your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join us next week. We're going to start a study of the book of Ezekiel, and then we're going to do Daniel. And they were contemporaries. They were both prophets during the um, exile of Judah in Babylon. One, uh, Ezekiel, was from the priestly tribe, and Daniel was from the royal tribe, or from the royalty. He was a prince versus a, a, a priest. So both of them are shadows of Christ. They're called the Son of Man in both books. Okay, see you next week. Until then, stay safe and apply the gospel to your roles and responsibilities of your relationships. relationships yes. Okay, we love you guys. Uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.